Amen. How great thou art. While Bob was singing that, and thank you, Bob, such a beautiful voice you have, I had my eyes closed, and I was thinking of my parents who were in heaven, and that was my mom's favorite song, and I could just see her and smiling down from heaven, and I'm sure we all have loved ones that we know are smiling down from heaven. Amen? Well, when I was in college, I sang with the Liberty Chorale, and sometimes we would travel to churches on weekends. These churches were always generous and kind enough to serve us a meal before our concert. But when we traveled to these southern churches, the main dish was usually southern fried chicken. Now you've probably heard the saying that in the south all Baptist preachers love southern fried chicken. But I heard a story about one pastor who couldn't stand it. As a matter of fact, he hated it. He hated it. And this one pastor was preaching a week-long evangelism meeting at another church and was eating in the homes of members before the services. And every night he was served the same meal, you guessed it, southern fried chicken. And after five nights of southern fried chicken, he arrived at a home for the final meal of the week. Yep. It was southern fried chicken. And it was bad enough, he could hardly even look at it. But the host asked him to pray a prayer. Would you pray for our meal, Pastor? And here's what he prayed. Lord, I've had it hot. I've had it cold. I've had it young. I've had it old. I've had it tender. And I've had it tough. But thank you, Lord, I have had enough. (laughs) At one time or another, most of us come to the place where we want to throw in the towel and say, Lord, I've had enough. And we all go through problems, don't we? And some of those can be quite troubling. And perhaps you might be going through a problem right now, whether it's a financial, a family problem, a physical problem or whatever it is, and you might just feel like, Lord, I've had enough. In the last several weeks, and even a little longer than that, actually, I've seen a few things happen in my life where I can certainly say that same thing. A few months ago, my wife, Beth, was complaining about her back hurting, and little did we know that this was going to be a very serious and very traumatic situation in our lives. To make a long story short, Beth went to uh, the emergency at UPMC and was admitted at UPMC Pittsburgh Hospital about four weeks ago to find out what the problem was. When she got to her room, a nurse came in and took her vitals and a few other things and then came in and, and said to her, well, Beth, you are scheduled for an MRI and you know that. And she said, yes. She said, there's something you may not know because we believe this is pretty serious, you're also scheduled for surgery. (laughs) What? We all took a step back. She has what you call, or had what you call drop foot. And the MRI showed that she also had a herniated disc and that the disc was ruptured. And Beth is younger than I am. (laughs) And she shouldn't have to go through that. But the surgeon told her if you didn't do it immediately, and that's why she had to have emergency surgery, she could have paralysis of her right foot and leg. Well, praise the Lord, that never happened. And Beth is doing better each day. And Beth and I certainly appreciate all your prayers for her. They mean so much. And so do the cards of encouragement. I never received that many cards of encouragement any time in my ministry, and I want to thank you for doing that for her. And of course, all the wonderful meals that were delivered to our home. And now we're praying that through her therapy, both physical and occupational and other things and other treatments, that everything returns to normal. But because Beth not being able to do some of the things she usually does, like shopping in a supermarket, yours truly 
has that rare privilege of doing that very confusing task. And men, it is very confusing, isn't it? So I have a question for all the men today, and I want you to raise your hands. How many of you do all, all the grocery shopping for your family? Men, raise your hands. Well, God bless you, sir. No, there were more hands than just one. <laughs> but God bless you, I tell you. Well, do you know how many different kinds of toilet paper there are? <laughs> really, I had no idea until I went shopping for my wife. And if you ask one of the guys that work there, they don't have a clue either. Well, after about an hour and a half of shopping for 12 items, I finally finished. And by the time I left the store, it was dark. And not only that, but it was snowing a lot. They called it a snow squall. And due to the terrible weather conditions, I was driving very slowly to home going up Perry Highway. However, I obviously wasn't going slow enough or fast enough because on my side, I met Dam Bambi's father head on. Or should I say, his head was on my windshield. I think that's more of a truer statement. And it was kind of, it happened so quickly, and it was a real surreal moment in my life. But it seemed that the impact of the deer was going very slow motion. And when the deer's head almost came through the windshield, it seemed as though he was trying to communicate something to me. Now, have you ever seen the television series, it's a cartoon called the Rocky and Bullwinkle Show, raise your hands. Rocky and Bullwinkle, okay. Rocky was a squirrel that had a very high voice. Well, I can't do that again. But Bullwinkle was a moose, and he had kind of a goofy voice. And when that deer's head was almost coming through my windshield, it was as though he was trying to communicate to me through Bullwinkle's voice by saying to me, well, Bob, what you going to do now? <laughs> well, I'll tell you exactly what I did. Very calmly, I pulled the car off the road, got out of the car, surmised the damage, and boy, oh boy, was there ever damage. The body shop estimated at $5,000, but praise the Lord, that's what we have insurance for, right? And very quietly, with no one around, I said several times with my hands raised, you have got to be kidding me. Sometimes in our lives, we see unforeseeable, unimaginable, and unthinkable things that take place. And sometimes we feel like saying, Lord, enough is enough. But one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament was Elijah. So if you would, please turn to 1 King, Kings chapter 19. And we'll be reading verses 1 through 5. Now, you'll notice I'm not going to be reading from the same version. I'm going to be reading from the NIV version because it emphasizes the words in my message. I've had enough, Lord. It says, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them, in other words, dead. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the desert, he came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. And said, I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. Now try to imagine, if you will, this great prophet sitting under a solitary tree in the desert. And in response to his prayers, God sent down fire from heaven and ended a three-year drought. He should have been on top of the world, shouldn't he be? Yet he finds himself in the depths of depression, even begging for God to let him die. We sometimes think of these Old Testament he as heroes, don't we? Superhuman. 
but they weren't. They were just human, just like you and just like me. Now many of us know what it's like to go through a mountaintop of happiness and also to experience the valley of despair. Do you know why I believe we have these stories from the Old Testament? They were written to give us hope. Now, I don't only believe that, but God does too. In Romans 15:4, it says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and encouragement of Scripture, we might have hope. My message today, and it's going to be brief, is about hope. My message next week might be about hope. I haven't decided yet. The Lord hasn't told me, but it might be. Because most people are familiar, as we know, with the famous statement about hope, which was written by the English poet Alexander Pope. But they usually only know half of that quotation. They remember, hope springs eternal in the human breast. That's the part most people recognize. But the part that they don't recognize is this. He says, man never is, but always is to be blessed. You see, Pope's take on hope is that man is always hoping, but never realizing blessing. But the Bible tells us that's not right. It has a complete different understanding of hope. Hope is not merely something we dream about. You see, we can have a living, breathing hope today. And that hope is through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? I want to give you a good acrostic I came about several years ago, and perhaps you've already heard this. But biblical hope, hope is having only positive expectations. Having only positive expectations. How many of you have had that kind of hope? I can't raise my hand either. It could be that we find ourselves in the same place as Elijah. Maybe we've lost hope and we feel like Elijah did. In this brief message, I'm going to just discuss three reasons why people often lose hope. Even the committed followers of God sometimes get discouraged. And here was a prophet that was so discouraged that he was ready for a non-profit existence. He asked God, just let me die. He was an emotional mess. But Elijah had gone beyond frustration. He was suffering from a full-blown depression. And many people struggle with depression, don't they? I want to give you some depressing facts from the National Institute of Mental Health. The first one is 17.6 million Americans deal with some kind of depression each year. One out of every five Americans will deal with depression in their lifetime. The rate of clinical depression among females is twice that of men. And untreated depression is the number one cause of suicide. It's easy to see why Elijah wanted to quit, isn't it? The same reasons that make people want to quit and give up today. And so I want to give you just three of those reasons. Number one, we want to quit when we feel physically drained. I've been there a few times, and I'm sure you have also. But Elijah was running for his life, wasn't he? And he ran all the way from Jezreel to Beersheba, which is about 70 miles, and that's quite a run. That would make anyone tired. And he was so exhausted from his confrontation with the 450 prophets of Baal already, and this sprint only made him more tired and exhausted. And we're the very same way. Sometimes we work until we're exhausted, and then we work more. And then we grit our teeth, and we keep on working. People's schedules are more hectic than they ever were before. Moms and dads are so busy, they seldom have time for their children, let alone themselves. And one reason I don't believe in evolutionary development is because if it were true, I believe that mothers would have four hands and not two. Amen. <laughs> Heard a story about a hard-charging businessman that started to have chest pain, so he went to his doctor. 
And he said, doctor, I don't know what to do. I'm having these chest pains. And the doctor took a look at him, checked him over pretty good. And he said, sir, the problem is that you're burning the candle at both ends. And the man said to the doctor, he said, look, doc, I didn't come for that. I just came for more wax. <laughs> when you don't give enough rest, you're prone <clears throat> for discouragement, and that leads to depression. The second reason is we want to quit when we feel emotionally deserted. The wicked queen Jezebel hated Elijah, hated him with a vengeance, and was out to get him. But Elijah felt as though everyone was against him. Take a look at verses 10 and 14. And in it we see that God says that he is the only one that's still faithful. But Elijah replies this. He says, I am the only one left and now they are trying to kill me. He was depressed, he was discouraged. And Elijah was having a pity party for just one. The devil wants to drive you and me away from the very people who can help us. And you know who they are. Every church has them. There's a gift called the gift of discernment. And I'm sure that we have many of our senior saints and others that have that gift of discernment. I know that as a matter of fact. And probably in your church also. But the good news is that we here at Grace Church have a great ministry called Stephen Ministry. And it reaches out to people like us when we go through problems, whether it be a financial, a family problem, a health problem, the loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, or some other reason that we have this ministry, and perhaps in your churches you do also. And I just want to let you know, if you don't have that in your church, or if you're in our church and you're going through a trial right now, if you feel this is something that you would like to be a part of, please don't hesitate to contact our church office. And our ladies will tell you exactly who to call and who to talk to, and they'll probably call you. And everything is com highly confidential. But we all have problems. Some are big problems and some are small problems. You know what the difference is between a big problem and a, and a small problem? Well, a big problem is something that I have and a small problem. It's like minor surgery. It's never minor if it happens to us. But if we isolate ourselves from others, especially those who want to help us, and that's what Satan wants to do, we become an easy target for the devil's discouragement. The third and final reason is that we want to quit when we are spiritually depleted. Elijah had just experienced a wonderful mountaintop high on Mount Carmel. Immediately after that, he was full of despair and depression. It's easy to go from the peak to the pit, isn't it? But sometimes you can be so involved with serving the Lord and doing good things that you find yourself running on empty. I heard a great message once, and it's just one word, actually three words, but the one word he says is, just say no. Now that's difficult, especially for me, for a pastor to tell you, especially when I say, would you pray about that ministry? No. Well, sometimes you need to say that. I've been involved in a few churches, and in, when we find people that are spiritually burned out, it's probably because they just didn't say no. They just got so involved in so much in good things. And I hate to say it, but in many times, in many cases, they never serve in a ministry again. So watch out when you become physically drained, when you become emotionally deserted and spiritually depleted, because that's exactly the time you'll find yourself wanting to quit. In closing, I want to read you a poem from an unknown author, and the simple title is Don't Quit. When things go wrong as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when funds are low and debts are high, 
and instead of the smile, you have a sigh. When care is pressing you down a bit, rest in God's love and never quit. Life can be strange with its twists and turns, and many a failed man has turned away when with God's help, he would have won the day. Don't give up, though the pace seems slow, for you may succeed with another go. Success is failure turned upside, inside out. The silver glint is the cloud of doubt. You never can tell how close you are. The goal may be near when it seems so far. So turn to the Lord when your heart is hit. Put your trust in him and never quit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this message today. Uh, it certainly has spoken in my life, Lord, and, and uh, Lord, I pray that things that uh, I need to change in my life, that I will also. Depression and doubt and discouragement, we all face. But we also know through your word that we're not facing them alone because you're right there beside us. Lord, we're so thankful that we can look to the heroes of the Bible, such as Elijah, and know that even though these were great men of God, that they were still just human, just like us. Lord, might we apply the things that we've learned today in our lives and fully realize the devil not only wants to destroy our lives, but the lives of our families and all those around us through doubt and discouragement. But Lord, we know that our blessed hope is in you and you alone. Thank you, Father, for your unconditional love for us. And might we share that love with someone we meet this week. 